Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue looking at what we were yesterday, uh, Daniel 11, verse 36, and some other things connected to it. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have each morning and uh, this last study of this week, morning study of this week. On Daniel chapter 11, the last vision of Daniel. We just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can be here to teach us, to instruct us. And we pray that you can help us in all the decisions that we make to glorify you. Be with us in this study and be with each person and their needs, their family and friends and the influence that we have. Thank you again for this opportunity. Enlighten our minds and open our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so there's a lot of things, and what I like to do on Thursdays is kind of bring some of these things together, tie up some loose ends. So, Daniel 11, verse 36. We know that this um, this this verse is important from an understanding of Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, because we know Uriah Smith and the pioneers said the king that shall do according to his will was... France, that is, this is going to refer uh, to this atheistic power of France. And we know that that's not the case. So, I mean, if we compare this with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we can see that this one who exalts himself and magnifies himself above every god is the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above God, or all that is called God or anything that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing that he is God. That is what we see here. This is uh, understood by the spirit of prophecy as well. So she connects this verse with Second Thessalonians. Uh, and what she's describing here, if you look in chapter 3 of the Great Controversy, is this transition from paganism to papalism that we see in these verses, 31 to 36. She says that the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. You know, we can see that this is going to be the setting up of the Sunday law. That's really what she's talking about. And we can see that that history is the history that we are in. So in interpreting this, we look at the historical application of these verses. And then we also look at a present truth application. So that's the history that's going to be repeated. So you look at what happened historically and you look at how this is going to be repeated. And so when we're looking at these at these verses, often we're looking at things that actually address the movement itself and sometimes things that address uh, a larger picture or perspective. And that can be a bit confusing. Um, one is I think that we could probably, if we wanted to, just have this uh, be a larger perspective. But I think some of the symbols that are given to us are meant to speak to this movement at this time. So the stuff that's in red is addressing conflicts that occur within this movement as they relate to the larger perspective. That is, this movement is, the purpose of this movement was to um, understand Millerite history to unseal the seven um, thunders, right? So those seven thunders that utter their voices, the understanding of Millerite history, that has been unsealed in this movement and has become a part of our experience. So that is, we connect to the pioneers through their experience. And so this movement has been experiencing what we've seen in this movement is, is the living out of what happened in Millerite history and early Adventist history. And, and so this becomes really important because in order to, to understand the message for this time, the pioneers have to be heeded. Now, um, often what people do when they look at the pioneers is they sort of pick and choose. And sometimes they include people as pioneers that weren't actually part of the messages in Millerite history. So, you know, obviously A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner are not pioneers in that context, right? They're, they weren't part of the first and second angels message. What about Loughborough? He, he sort of borders on it. He's, he's, he's one of those guys who, 
So he he was definitely alive then because he's born January 26, 1832. But he wouldn't be what we call a pioneer. We, we often refer to him as a pioneer. But he wouldn't be a part of the Millerite movement in that sense. I mean, he's going to come in um, 1878. Let me see. I'm just trying to see exactly when he's. Uh, okay, so he began in 1852. So, so technically, he wouldn't be a pioneer either. Um, but of course, you know, James White would be a pioneer. Joseph Bates would be a pioneer. Hiram Edson, they would be pioneers. And of course, Miller and Josiah Litch, those, those types of people. I'm trying to think of the other guy's name, guy who funded the the magazines, the papers. I uh, just can't think of his name offhand. Just. On the tip of my tongue. Anyway, I'll think of it later. But anyway, there are people that are pioneers and they experienced the first and second angels messages. And, and now those, they're, they're all dead. And so they need to speak. But one of the ways that they speak is that we enter into that experience. So in this repeat of history, we have to experience what they experienced on some level to understand it. And so when the seven thunders were unsealed, in this movement, it was through our experience that they were unsealed. The movement was moving through Millerite history. We were repeating Millerite history. And yet some people don't really believe that. That is, when we had the disappointment, um, they, they reframe it as some kind of mistake or error. And of course, they, in that very way of doing it, they're repeating Millerite history. Right? They say nothing happened on October 22nd, 1844. It was a mistake. Nothing happened on July 18, 2020. It was a mistake. We had the wrong date. But we shouldn't have set time at all, right? We should just be watching and waiting, not really understanding that watching and waiting includes measuring the time. It includes chronology. It's just that uh, we are not to predict events in advance because we can't know the date of events in advance. But we can watch and wait, and we can recognize symbols as they pass. So this, to me, is an extremely important point that's not understood by the vast majority of the movement today, and should have been. That is, we had every opportunity to know this. It was pressed upon us many times. That is, it's it's something that was right in front of us, and yet when we came to to see the disappointment. We didn't want to see the disappointment. We didn't want to believe that we would be disappointed, even though we were warned that we would be. And then when the disappointed ha disappointment happened, many people initially renounced it um, right at the be beginning. Some people were just ready to renounce it right away. Some took a little bit more time. And then as we've moved on, um, you know, we're in this history where Miller has renounced it. And, and people are willing to follow Miller. I mean, Jeff, right? So, so we can see the parallels. And, and that's why we're looking at the present truth application. That is, we're looking at what's happened in the past in Millerite history. And we can see that we're repeating the same thing. So 1798 to 1844 has a parallel within the movement in a, in a sort of narrower sense of the 777 days. Right. So from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. Now, we know that November 9th, 2019 also connects to November 9th, 1989. So you could zoom out a little bit and, and make an application. And so, you know, in some ways we could say that there's there, there's definitely more than one application that can be made in this repeat of history. But for us presently at this time, the symbols continue to point to this narrow Focus. This is zooming in to what has happened in the movement. Okay, so um, so a couple of loose ends. Well, yesterday we had we had dealt a little bit with this forty-five years, and so we're just going to look at this uh, briefly. So one of the things that we had noted is that um, there's this this symbol about understanding. They that under of understanding. That's the wise. It was uh, this number 
6213, I think. Uh, they that understand. Oh, there's uh, this one. Okay, that's this one. 79. So that's the 144,000. And then there was another number. Maybe it's earlier. But so many things. I'm forgetting all these numbers. It's hard to believe. But it should be here somewhere. Even like in the footnotes. Oh, yeah, that was um, adding. No, that's it. So that was adding, helping with a little help. That's the one I'm thinking of now. So 16,246, and that's 45 prophetic years and 46 days. So again, this, this shows that we are in this history. So when we think about the help, when we think about the earth helping the world, we know while they flee into the wilderness. So when the earth helps the woman, is that the United States? So the woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 years. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12. I'm just seeing if everybody understands it this way. So in Revelation chapter 12, so the woman fled into the wilderness in verse 6 for 1260 years. Obviously, 12 verse 6, 1260 years, 1,203 score days. So that's that's for the 1260 days. And then we're going to see that there is this, it shows this great controversy, this war in heaven. The dragon was cast out, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan that deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. His angels were cast out with him. So it gives us this view of the great controversy and talks about, um, you know, things that we would connect to Christ coming the first time, because this is in the context of Christ coming the first time. It's, it's, it's just going back to that. So when the man child is born, because the dragon sought to devour the man child when he was born. And then and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child, right? So it's brought us back to that, verse 13. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. So during this 1260 years, uh, we have these two wings of a great eagle that are, are being spoken of. Now, um, we, we probably should do a study on this sometime, but in the book of, um, I think it's in the book of Enoch, where it talks about a prophecy very similar to this, about this eagle um, and these feathers. So I don't know if people are familiar with that. But anyway, I think it does relate to this. Um, but anyway, there's two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. And here we have this time, times, and in half. So uh, one of the things is kind of interesting. So we know that there's a time, times, and a half, a time, times, a dividing at times. We get that in Daniel 7, verse 25, and Daniel 12, verse 7. Um, and in Revelation 11, it's going to talk about 42 months and 1,203 score days. Right. So we know that these are the same period. And then in, in chapter 12, it's going to talk about the 1260 days. And then it's going to talk about the time times and in half or half a time. Right. From the face of the serpent. And this is one of the ways if you're going to show people that uh, a prophetic year is 360 days and a prophetic month is 30 days is by comparing these. And so it's pretty clear that she goes into the wilderness, but she's given these two wings of a great eagle. And, and I don't want to go into this in too much detail here. But when we think of an eagle in scripture, one of the things it represents is Rome, right? So if we if we reference an eagle, it can bring us all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, dealing with verse uh, 15. It, don't, it, don't it also represent the United States? Hey. Yes, but that we really get there, right? So we have to understand why it represents the United States. That that that's the point that I'm trying to make. So the Lord shall bring forth a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor so, show favor to the young. Right? And this is going to talk about this siege. This is the siege in 70 A.D. 
And we know in Daniel chapter 8, it's going to reference this uh, in verse uh, 23 of chapter 8. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So this is a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 to this this nation of fierce continents and um, a language that you do not understand, right? So understanding dark sentences, there, there's this connection, right? The, the fierce continents and this inability to understand something that's being said. Okay, so we know that this is Rome. And then when we deal with going back to Revelation chapter 12, we know that that the persecution, the, the power that's been persecuting God's people in the past was pagan Rome. And now we have this power, which is papal Rome. So we can see that this dragon, which represents Satan and pagan Rome, is going to persecute God's people. That's what's very clear here. Um, but we know that there is going to be this beast, this other beast, the composite beast, the beast from the sea, uh, that's going to persecute the woman as well. So it's during this time that she's given this two wings of a great eagle to flee into the wilderness. Now, there's a couple of things that we think about here. When we think about two wings of a great eagle, what what is being illustrated here? Just in a very basic geometric sense, geometry. What, what's being what, what do you mean by a geometric sense? Geometry. Just think about geometry. So we have two wings of oh, a great I was eagle. horrible in geometry. <laughs> okay. It's a chiasm, is it not? Well, the two wings, yeah, I can see that. Right, with the, with the bird at the center, the eagle at the center. So I think this actually represents the 2520. The, the two the two twelve sixties because there's a persecution that happens under pagan Rome for twelve hundred and sixty years for a time times and a half and a persecution that happens under papal Rome for a time times and a half that's the way that I interpret this whether that's correct or not that that this that during the time that God is persecuted or, or God's people are being persecuted these are periods of time that are given. And God is protecting his people. We can also think, though, of an eagle as a protective power, too, right? So if we look up eagle, we can see it, that it can relate yeah. to Rome. Um, but it's uh, Psalm. I've been, I've been doing that. I'm also thinking of Obadiah 4, where God promises to bring the eagle down, no matter how high it exalts itself. Yeah. And then there's one of the Psalms. Um, I can't think which one it is. It's a bird of prey, definitely. It, it devours carrion. That's like God's sanitation crew. You know? Maybe. Maybe I'll just look up eagle. So, you know, if we do a word study on eagle, you can see that it has these different symbols. It talks about things that we can't eat. Um, is it Psalms? Yeah. No, maybe. Okay, there's you get the face of the eagle, great eagle, great things. It's going to talk about it in Ezekiel um, 17, 7. This one I forgot about because there's another one. It was also another great Psalm eagle. Psalm 103, 5 about our youth being renewed like, like the eagles. Yeah, renewed like the eagle. That's which one? Psalm 103, 5. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that the youth is renewed as the eagle. I thought there was another one in Psalms, but... Maybe I'm thinking of feathers or something like that. Uh, but in Ezekiel 17, the great eagle with great wings, long winged, full of feathers. Let's take a look at this one. The parable of the two eagles in the vine. Son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the seer. I know we studied into this before. I don't know. I'm uh, just quickly reading through this. I don't know if I want to look at that right now. Anyway, because it's going to take us too far off track of what I want to 
uh, get to. So the basic idea, I mean, we know that the eagle is a symbol of the United States, but the question is why? So let's, let's just try to make this a bit shorter. So the idea is that um, the United States is a continuation of Rome. You know, A.T. Jones, The Two Republics, he illustrates this really clearly, that the United States institutions, its republic, is modeling itself after the Roman Republic. That, that was the model that was being used. But it has the same problem. Even though it's a constitutional republic, it's going to speak as a dragon. So during this time, God, God has his protection over, yeah, yeah, so just the symbol of the eagle with the arrows and feathers. So when the United States happens, the idea that, that I want to get to is that the earth helps the woman. So there's going to be these two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nursed for a time, times and a half, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth, of his mouth, water as a flood after the woman that she might, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth helped the woman. So during this persecution, the idea that the earth helping the woman is the United States. That is, people going from the old world to the new world. So I mean, that just, you know, so I had all these other things there, but we can see that this eagle is a type of protection. In the United States, having the symbol of the eagle shows this, that there is this republicanism that's going to protect the woman does, does that make sense to people do people agree with that that the earth helping the woman is the united states it's not just that she's in the wilderness because the united states is the wilderness as well but it's the earth helping the woman is the rise of the united states and the yeah, earth i can see that and i can also i can also see the movement those who remain faithful as like the earth, which, and Paul was speaking about the man child, and so, so, so does John. You know, we're trying to bring forth Christ in the sense that we are going to be, hopefully all of us, when I say we will be there, or at least will be saved when Christ returns, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like we're the earth, we're the earth. Compared to the woman who's forming the man child. I don't know if you can figure what yeah. I'm saying. That's pretty abstract, but you know, right. like Christ is being formed within us, so to speak, as Paul mm -hmm. spoke of. Yeah. So when it says the earth helped the woman, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. This would be referring to the rise of the United States to the American constitution. Right. And then it says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it refers to the rise of Adventism. So it brings us to the end of the 1260 and actually the 2520, the 2 2520s for northern Israel into Millerite history. And then we see this great controversy now being worked out through the issues of the everlasting gospel, the, the two classes of worshipers. And then finally, we have the remnant, which is the Seventh-day Adventists, um, which keep the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which we understand is fulfilled in Ellen White, not just because we call the books or call it the spirit of prophecy. We call it the spirit of prophecy um, because it is. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Some people think, oh, we, we take the word spirit of prophecy and see, oh, she wrote these books called spirit of prophecy. So somehow we just connect it. No, we understand why we call the books that because we believe them to be a fulfillment of that. So when we go back to Daniel chapter 11, um, and still there's some loose ends I still want to tie up here, but we talk about this, um, helping with a little help. I just want to go back to address that. So we had had this period of time that, uh, that we said is in prophetic time is 45 years and 46 days. And um, we also have this diagram that Stephen sent me. So he wanted to look at that period of time of 45 years. And this was based upon 
that we were talking about. At least that's what I think. So he counts the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844 is 1,533 days. And that can be divided by seven. So it's 219 times seven. And then he notices that from February 15th, 1798 to the first day of the first month, the second angel's message arriving is 219 times 77 days. Simply, uh, another way of looking at it is this is 219 times 7 times 11. 219 times 7 times 11, because 7 times 11 is 77, 219. And this gives us a period of 16,863 days. So he, he didn't put that number of days there, but that would be the number of days from 15th of February, 1798, to April 18th, 1844, I guess sunset. So he's marking there, sunset. And and that would mean if we go from Feb- February 15th, 1798 to October 22nd, 1844. Yeah, so that's going to be, uh, so it depends how you count these things, but it's going to be uh, 17,050 days. Right. So you add 187 to 16,863 days. So so the number that we have for 45 years and 46 days, uh, that number was one, six, two, four, six. So there's 803 days difference and or 804 days difference. Pardon me. And if we look at that time to 1844, so if we count from uh, February 15th, 1798, the time of the end, to October 22nd, 1844, is that what I'm counting to? October 22nd, 1844. It's, um, it's actually 47 years in prophetic time, right? So I'm using prophetic time and 130 days. So in, in real time, it's obviously 46 years and however many, many days. Anyway, just, just to kind of clarify that point, that those spans of time. Now, when we deal with, so I'll do it this way. So when we deal with Daniel 11, verse 36. So Daniel 11, verse 36 addresses the man of sin, right? So the king that shall do it according to his will. Now, of course, he's going to begin at the beginning of the 1260, but we can also mark his demise when the, till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Now, uh, the Levitical or the lexical sum of this is 82,499. It's 499. So 82,499. And, and I found it interesting that if we count from uh, the first day of the first month, or, or not from the first day of the first month, from February 15th, 1798, and we count 82,499 days, we come to January 1st of this year uh, in 2024. So this January 1st, 2024, you can see it's, it's 82,499 days from February 15th, 1798. And is that significant that we get to the first day of the first month of this year when we take this verse? So what what we would be doing is we'd be connecting what happens in 1798 at the end of the 1260 to our year, the, the symbol of the first day of the first month. Is that meaningful or is that just not meaningful? So you have to think about that. I think it's meaningful, but it, it, so it puts some emphasis upon this year in relationship to this movement, because that's how we're understanding these symbols. They relate to this movement. Now, I'm not sure what, what it means, like, cause we're not time setting. We're just, we're just connecting, uh, what's happening in the movement now with these symbols. And we can see, you know, Jeff is going to begin speaking on December uh, 30th. 
So that's like a couple of days, uh, obviously, before January 1st. Right? So December 30th is going to be the first time that he speaks. That's going to be 1260 days after July 18. You know, I, I mean, a person could you know, try to say, well, we're going to count uh, 82,499 days. That'll bring us to December 31st, the next day. Whatever we know, it's 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 close in that proximity, but it's more the symbol of the first day of the first month. Because when we address, like yesterday, for instance, we didn't talk about it, but it was the first day of the first month of the biblical calendar in 2024, and so it might have been appropriate to talk about it yesterday. And I and I did figure it out yesterday, uh, but we didn't end up talking about it. So we have this. The symbol of the first day of the first month in 2024, yesterday, and we had already marked that on our lines, and, and <coughs> we had done that. Uh, which chart was it? I'll just find this here. So that was counting so many charts here. Because we had the one where we had uh, April 8th also marked. I guess I'm just going to have to search for it. don't know how I wrote it out, though. So April 10th. Lots of April 10th. Okay, so that was um, from 9-11, those times, right, where we, we had April 8th and April 10th. April 8th marking the eclipse, April 10th marking the first day of the first month. That's 8,248 days. That's adding the word those and the word times together, 1992 and 6256. Right, I could probably show you the diagram. Right. So this is where we had April 10th. So that was yesterday. So that's the first day of the first month as a symbol. And there's 2,187 days to April 5th, 2030, this first day of the first month. And we have this first day of the first month connected to 9-11 through the story of Ezra 9 or Ezra, well, 7 to 10, I guess is what it is, dealing with the 20th day of the ninth month. And then the first day of the first, the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. So... So we've connected that first day of the first month to the end of the divorcement. And I'm saying that the divorcement has happened in this movement in this sort of zoomed in way. And, and I believe that that has to happen throughout Adventism. Now, if we say that a divorcement has happened, that a divorce has occurred between this movement um, or within this movement, between the, the groups or the factions within this movement, whatever you want to call them. You know, I think that that has occurred. I don't think that there is a connection between how we study and how other people are studying, unfortunately. I think it's a symbol of that, the first day of the first month, and that that happens in this, this period of time. So we could say, you know, if we go to January 1st, 2024, well, we could see that that definitely would be connected, right? We could say that 82,499 days in an inclusive count would bring us to December 31st, which is, you know, where we're going to discuss what had happened on December 30th, um, the 1260 days from July 18th when Jeff decided to speak. But it, it, it's really already occurring. So it's not like we say in a specific date, you know, this is when the divorcement is completed. But we are saying in 2024 it is. That, I mean, and Jeff has clearly marked out that we are not to have fellowship, that is, they're not to have fellowship with anybody who doesn't accept what they're saying. So we're divorced, right, from the movement. They're it's not like we want to be divorced. We're not signing the divorce papers. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying the divorce has occurred, whether we wanted it to happen or not. It's um, it's not something we had control over. And once Jeff stepped into the scene, that was it, right? He, he came back, and that that's it. People are just going to follow Jeff. They're not going to care about, like, actually studying. They're not gonna, it's not gonna matter to them that what he's writing makes no sense and is in, internally contradictory, that it rejects many things that we've, we've believed in the past and has added things that used to be considered fanaticism. And that he's not really 
able to answer the question why he's choosing certain things and rejecting others. We just have to accept it because he's the prophet. And, and really, he's in the same boat. And I don't like saying this at all, but as what Parminder was doing, this this or, is not it's also the papal vote. Like I haven't been hearing going through a lot of the stuff. Like, myriads of it have passed by. I've yeah. been mainly pouring over this stuff, like trying to understand this stuff, and it is difficult. But I can see where we're heading. I can see the light in it, you know. And of course, it hurts. But I mean, I can't. I was raised a papist. I cannot stand another papal tyranny. Somebody dictating to me, okay, you believe this or else you're cut off. You're not part of us. This is what I went through under the papacy. Do I want it again? No, not from it, anybody. We, and we went through it with the church. And yeah, well, with me, it wasn't so bad because some of the folks, at least that I was with, were genuine SDA, even though a lot yeah. of them are probably still in the mainstream. They believed in studying for yourself. They right. encouraged me to read books. The, the, re, the reason I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I mean, I was already keeping the Sabbath. I already believed the state of the dead. I believed in baptism and so forth. But I went to an Adventist church and went to the Sabbath school. And the Sabbath school was an argument. I've told this story many times. But there was a an heated discussion, not not a hateful discussion, but a serious discussion, something I'd never seen in a church before. And yet the people who were discussing were still friends, still able to to smile and laugh after church talking together. Right. It and that to me was the thing that attracted me, because I knew that where open and true discussion is allowed to occur, that truth can be found. Right. When when the conversation is controlled. There's not much opportunity for truth to be found. And the upper room Bible studies that we had in my house, they started April 20th, uh, 1985, that we had in the attic of my place. The way that we studied is how we are studying now. There was nobody there as the authority saying, here is what we have to understand and you must accept it. Everyone was heard. Everything was considered. And we patiently took time to try to understand for ourselves. Lots of times there were disagreements because our understanding was very limited. My understanding was very limited, but I knew that we were coming to an understanding of the truth because it kept being witnessed to. It wasn't because somebody said you have to believe this, that you believed it. It was because it became evident, right? Because of the evidence. And, and that's how we should study. And so if something is true, I shouldn't have a fear about it being examined. I shouldn't see contrary voices unless they are attacking, malicious, uh, disruptive, unchristlike in how they approach things. Uh, you know, then that would, might be different. But we're not talking about that. We're just talking about people seeing things differently. And being shut down and and not having a discussion, not wanting a discussion about it. And and if it was true, the discussion would be welcome because it would actually reinforce the truth. Right. It's, It's to me, it's a pretty simple thing. If what you're saying is error, it needs to be examined for one. But also, if it is true, it's strengthened by being examined. So all I'm saying is that. What we have had in this movement is a divorce. We didn't want it. We did everything we could to try to avoid it. And and I can look at it, my own personal experience, because I was divorced from my first marriage. Not a divorce that I wanted. I had seven children, you know, five and two, five boys, two girls. I didn't want a divorcement. You know, I'm not saying it was a happy marriage. It wasn't. It was a very stressful marriage. But no way would I ever want to divorce my wife. Right? I did everything I could for 10 years to try to restore that marriage. What, what was in my power to try to do? Nothing I could do. The divorce happened without me signing divorce papers or anything. I fought against it. Didn't hire a lawyer because that's a waste of money. But, but the point is, 
From that lesson, I can see the same thing happening in this movement. I have done everything, and I believe that you have as well. We try to listen to what's being said. What are the complaints? We try to understand. We, we make concessions, not compromises, but concessions. And at every turn, the movement has decided that they don't want to hear. And when somebody doesn't want to hear anymore, when they have closed you off, that's a divorcement. And that's what has happened, you know, in this movement is a divorcement. Doesn't mean that we have to like it. Doesn't mean we have to, you know, sign the divorce papers. Doesn't mean that we wanted it. Because we definitely didn't. But it's just the reality of what has happened. It's an extremely painful experience as well. Because the people in this movement that we got to know, we love those people, right? We don't have any animosity towards them. Some of them were our, our very close friends. Some of them we might have considered our best friends. And yet, you know, they don't want to have anything to do with us. It's not very pleasant. And it's not because we're, we're so proud that we won't bend or anything like that. You know, they might characterize that as. It's just a simple fact that they never wanted to hear anything in the first place. And you hate to talk about it. Like, it's not a pleasant thing to talk about. But I think it is, is something that we have to recognize is that divorce has occurred. And we do have to accept it. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, as individuals, we're not going to, we're, we're still going to talk to whoever will, you know, be friends with us. You know, we're not going to, you know, have a fight about it. We're not going to speak mean things about them or be hateful because we don't hate them. And we, we don't believe that, that that's, that that's, that, that that would make any sense. I mean, it's not even in our heart to do that. We need to recognize though, that this divorce has occurred within this movement. And it's typical of what is going to happen. That is within Adventism in the general sense, a divorce is going to occur. That is, you're going to have the large majority of the Seventh-day Adventist church close out any opportunity to hear truth. Any person who is attached to truth. We know that. It's, it's, it's talk, Ellen White, some of her earliest visions talk about this separation that happens. So it's going to occur from the strange woman. The strange woman is this way of studying. So this is about how we study more than anything else. Are we going to study line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little? Are we going to put things on a line? Are we going to measure the time? Are we going to watch and wait? Are we going to be open to God's leading? Are we going to uh, be truly converted? Are we going to experience the everlasting gospel? this three-step testing prophetic message that will develop and demonstrate two classes of worshipers. Are we going to be part of the wise? Are we going to have oil in our lamps? Right? All of these little illustrations, it has to be a part of our experience. It's not about being right. It's not about, you know, having the correct interpretation of Revelation 17. It's the process of studying. In um, in education, they call it um, what's the word they use? I'm trying to think. So there is uh, I can't remember. It's 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 a nice little phrase. But basically, idea there is the process of learning, and then there is the product of learning. And the most important thing is the process, right? How you approach learning, because. A person could just memorize for an exam and do get a good mark on an exam, right? He could memorize a bunch of stuff. But if he hasn't gone through the proper process, if he hasn't spent time reading and studying and thinking about things that aren't necessarily on the test but are connected, is he going to remember all of those, that list of things he studied and memorized? Is it even going to be meaningful? So, uh, the point is that as we study these things, we're eating God's word. It becomes a part of our experience. 
We're, we're taking up the cross. There's all these different metaphors used in scripture. And, and they represent um, Christ's life, his word, becoming a part of our life. Christ's character, his, what God speaks into existence. Um, he speaks through his word to recreate in us this new heart, this new life, this new mind. Uh, that we can reflect his character and that we can act and operate in a way that's going to glorify him, not glorify us. So that to me is, is what's being talked about in, in understanding these, these verses. So when I look at this, uh, let me see if I got to put a footnote in here somewhere. So this verse, so I'm just going to put it at the end of this verse. So the lexical, too many nines there, days, which can be counted from February 15th, 1798 to January 1st, 2024. End of the the force, which is not wrong. So we we should be able to see that 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 that's meaningful. Oh, you can't see that because I didn't change the screen. Here we go. So it's not it's not something that we like to think about, but we need to recognize it has occurred. And um. We can see that this also, April 10th, 2024, and and that April 10th, 2024 is just um, the period of time from 9-11 to, so it's 8,248 days. Is that number right? Yeah, so 8,248 days. So we can see that all of this is connected, that this, this rise of the papacy, and the end of the papacy is 1260 years. Um, and it's going to connect to, uh, to our history. Just thinking here briefly. So I want to put this in here. Okay, I'm going to go back to this calendar converter briefly. So I just want to, want to put some of these things in here and just see what they yield. So, um, we got this January 1st, 2024. We know that. Two days before Jeff is going to um, speak, and that's going to be 1260 days uh, from July 18th, 2020. And then you got uh, another two days to this divorcement thing. So you could say it's a period of three days. And then we have also the first day of the first month in 2024, April 10th. And you can see there's a hundred days from uh, the first day of the first month, that is from January 1st to April 10th. So what is a hundred days? You should remember this. How about the days of prayer? Okay, 144,000 minutes, right? Can we see that? Now, now the other way that we can also look at it is we can see, and, and not that the eclipse means, you know, what people try to attribute it to it. But we also have that April 8th date in there for the eclipse. Now, the April 8th date as a symbol, that's the date I got married uh, 11 years ago to Heidi. So um, so that was my anniversary. And you can see that that's going to be 100 days from the December 30th date. Right. So again, the symbol of 144,000 with that as well. So obviously they're two days apart and, and it's going to work like that. Now, now today's Heidi's birthday. So please pray for her. And, and she, she would be 45 today. So she's 45. Um, so that's a, an important symbol. So, you know, we could probably, uh, you know, look at that symbol as well. But anyway, this is, this is what we have. We have all of these, these, uh, symbols. The ties to the first day of the first month, to the divorcement, to marriage, right? To the 144,000 symbols. So all of these symbols come together in this.
context of these verses. And um, if we think about Daniel chapter 11, verses 31 to 36, and Ellen White talks about this repeat of the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. You know, she first starts with verse 30, and then she quotes verse 31 to 36, right? You know, so events similar to this are going to occur. And we can see that that's, that's what we have. Now, when we get to verse 36 itself, so we, we, of course, addressed verse 30 to 35. We have dates in there that we lined up. But when we get to verse 36 and we look at the symbols here, the symbols are going to address uh, the, the papacy itself, what it is in its original form historically. But it's going to be uh, this king of the north now that shall, um, or the king of the north, the king of the north, the papacy, through the image of the beast by the United States. This is Revelation 13, where we see this image to the beast. So we see that there's this deadly wound that occurs to the papacy when the indignation is accomplished. And that's that's in a symbol of the close of human probation, 1798. Maybe we should say, you know, to 1844, but... and. But we're just saying that, uh, you know, it's connected to that call. The hour of God's judgment has come. Worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea, the fountains and waters. Right. So we know that's the, the first angel's message, which includes the second and third angel. Um, in its in its uh, scope. Right. And so for that, that is determined that 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 is decreed or cut off. Right. Is this 45 years. And we're saying that this relates to, it relates to the Trump prophecy. Because of the symbol of the 45, we can see the 45, and of course the 46 uh, shall be done, right? So we know that this, that this is referring to our history. It's not giving us really specific, like we're not applying this now uh, to this movement in some specific way, other than that this movement is in the history of the Sunday law. That's what this movement is about. And that this 45 years, the, the, the difference between the 1290 and the 1335, I put in there the Trump prophecy because of the 45 years. But it's, it's not just about the Trump prophecy, but it is, right? I, I, I'm trying to think how to explain that. Because did Trump fulfill his role in this 777 days. Yes, he did. Right. And, and, and we, we saw that happening. Trump was there at the beginning of the pandemic, right? He is a Xerxes being deceived by, uh, Haman, right? And, and then there are some other things that we're going to have to, to try to address, but uh, I don't want to go into those right now. I just want to try to, to sum this up here. Um, that that there is this Trump prophecy, and we can say that Trump still has a, a role, or at least the Trump prophecy has a role, because there is a disappointment attached to it. Now, we would call that the first disappointment if we get to the 1335. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335. So there are two different... There are two different prophecies that this movement has. We have July 18, 2020, and we have the prophecy regarding Trump becoming president. Now, were we correct about July 18, 2020? Did Nashville get attacked? Well, we would have to say, no, we weren't correct, right? We, we were in error. But was July 18, 2020 an error? No, it was appointed by God, just like October 22, 1844. It was meant to test us, right? To try to purge and to make them white, right? November 9th, uh, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, we have this. And July 18th is in the middle of that. Yet we know 
that this is all typical of what is going to happen. So we expected December 25th, 2021 to, to, we knew it was a symbol of the Sunday law. We didn't know what that meant at the time when we, we had that in our line, but we could see that it's a symbol of the Sunday law, the December 25th date by itself is, um, but it was part of this structure. But even prior to that, we had January 6th, 2021, right? January 6th is when the United States is, is going to have a battle between the King of the North and the King of the South. So there's some way in which we have to, to understand this in that we know that Daniel 11 verse 40 uh, represents a battle between the King of the North and the King of the South. Two different battles, in fact. A is going to be 1798. Daniel 1140 B is going to be 1989. And we know that that history occurs within our movement in some way. And so we can say that January 6th, 2021 represents uh, Raphia, right? That's the King of the South defeating the King of the North. And, and that's what happens when the indignation is accomplished, right? In 1798, the King of the South defeats the King of the North, correct? So if that's true, we can see that this verse, when the indignation is accomplished, maybe instead of like making this so broad, I mean, we can put here maybe, what if I put January 6th, 2021, I know it's just uh, that if we look at the this Sunday law crisis, we, we can say that we're still in this. But 1798 is going to represent January 6, 2021. And that would fit with having that 45 years of the Trump prophecy there. I'm going to do something here just quickly. So I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just trying to see if this is correct or not. Okay, what was this other? I'm trying to remember what it was that I was looking at. Okay. Theodore, instead yeah. of exile from the movement, could you put exile from the rest of the movement? Because we are the movement. We're just going forward where the others are retracting and reparating. And I hate uh, to say that, but it is true. Well, well, but, but the Millerites exiled you know, the, the Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, they were pushed out of the movement. The movement, you know, the Adventist movement still continued. It became this, uh, you know, the first-day Adventists. I don't know. I, I know what you're saying. But but I think it is an exile from the movement. I, I'm going to compare it to an exile because... An exile from, from a part of the movement, yes. But, I mean, how can people call themselves the present truth movement if they're rejecting present truth or they just have snippets of it or parts of it here and there. This is really bothersome to me, you know? Okay. Well, I understand, but uh, it's the same thing happened in Christianity when Christians were exiled. Okay. So I'm trying to figure this out. Um, I can't find it now. Okay. I'll show you what I'm doing. So maybe that, maybe you can help me. Now, we have here, um, shall be done, okay? Now, that's 6213. What is 6213? Could be a few different things, right? But if we put it as a date, it could be the 6th of February, 2013, right? I mean, it could be, saying that that's a possibility. So the 6th of February, 2013, that would be my 50th birthday. And that's connected to um, part of the structure. It, obviously, my 52nd birthday in 2015, it becomes a symbol of July 18, 2020, because 360 times 52 is 18720. But anyway, if, if I took this as the 6th of February, 2013, and I connected this to, to the events in this movement presently. Um, I'm just looking at some of the different dates. So 
Okay, so one of the things from my birthday in 1963 to uh, Jeff speaking is 22,242. And that there was a number that we had that was 2,242, not 22,242. And that was, let me see if I can find it. So H24, or is it two, pardon me, 2242, was that it? No, it must have been 2422. Maybe that's what it was. No, we had 2220. I thought we had a 2242 somewhere. I may be remembering wrong. Well, I just looked up 2242 in Strong's and it says it's a Persian Oregon Zithar, a eunuch of Xerxes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that wasn't the number. I thought we had it. Somewhere I ran into that. I'm trying to think where. Now, maybe I'm thinking of the 2220, but that's the arm. No, I'm pretty sure there was a 24 somewhere. Anyway, I'm, so that, that's, so this period of time, uh, 22,242, yeah, something about that. It has my birthday as a symbol there. Um, however, that's going to connect. What it's going to connect to, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just saying that that number, so shall be done, 6213. So anyway, that would be my 50th birthday. I'm not sure if that's how we would make that significant or what, not that I'm trying to, but I'm just saying that that's my birthday in when I turn 50, the 6th of February, 2013. Where that connects to, I would have to put more dates in there. So that's, I'm going to look at that um, over the next few days just to try to see what that could connect to. So, uh, so connecting when Jeff speaks, that's 22,242. If I go to uh, January 6, 2021, it's uh, 21,154, something I'm not seeing. Okay, I need to put in... Oh, that's what I didn't put in there. So we got to think about these different uh, dates. So of the line, so not just July 18. Okay. So now. Okay. So before I do that, I want to address something else here. So I'm going to come back to that later. So one of the things we were looking at was, yeah, I want to look at this. Okay. So I want to address this uh, uh, flatteries. Um, so I was looking at this earlier. So this was just another loose end. Now, so the word that's translated um, as flattery, right? So he shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries, right? And it says um, um, with flatteries that uh, they shall cleave to them with flatteries. That's the one I wanted to look at. Um, and so we address that a uh, little bit. Uh, I was looking at the whole phrase itself. So I'm going to look at that again. But what do we notice about this word? 2519. H2519. First, let's address that. So what about that number do you notice? So it's, it's one less than 2520. So you add one to it. It's 2520. So what does that symbolize? 2520 minus one. And it's the word flatteries. Could, could we say it's a counterfeit then? Yeah, it's it's not quite the whole truth, right? That is right. That. It's it's deficient, okay, by one, which is of course, and and that is the truth, is the truth, but but false education uses truth, but not the whole truth. So that's that's the way that I would look at that number itself. Now, of course, you know, we could take it as a date. It could be um, the 2nd of May in 2019. You know, it could be February 5th, 2019. Right. You, you know, we could use it in that way. The thing is about this number, I know I've run into it in some of our spans of time. I just don't remember where. 
Now, we know, of course, it's less than seven years uh, divided by 360 it would almost be seven years, but divided by 365, it ends up being six years. Let's try this again. Uh, two, five, one. It ends up being six years in 327 and a half days. So it's got a symbol there of 327, six years and 327 and a half. So normally it would be usually 328 days um, once you do the count. Now, we had six years as symbols, so we've had other numbers where we've had these six years. And I'm going to have to think about that a little bit. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so it definitely, I think it does connect to February 5th, uh, 2013, but I don't know if I have enough time to go through this whole thing because we just got a minute. So we'll, we'll come back to this. We're going to try to address some of these little details. So what we can see is that clearly um, our history is being represented in this repeat of history. So when Ella White says that this scene similar to this will occur, history will be repeated, uh, quotes these verses, um, we can see that it's occurring in our time. But we need to remember that our time right now, what we are experiencing, is typical of what's going to happen. Right? So we need to remember that because we're not in those events yet. We are going to move to them fairly quickly. And, and just getting back to the idea of January 6, 2021 being raffia, I believe that in that context of that being raffia, that what we see right now is Paneum happening. It's being set up. But we know there's going to be a civil war in the United States. We know that um, on a much bigger scale, there's going to be this backlash. And so we're, we're trying to understand it right now. We don't, we don't have all the answers to this. But I think we can see how what we're experiencing is important in understanding what's going to happen. Okay, so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I know there's a few things in the, ch the chat there, um, which I think we addressed. The one that um, Iran put in there yesterday was 11.8.8 on the Mayan, like the first and last Bible verse combined sum of 11.8.8. Okay. So that, that is the combined sum of the first verse in the Bible and the last verse in the Bible is 1188, right? That's what you mean, Iran? Yeah, that's they're both the, 1188. Yeah, that's the gematria, not the lexical sum. The gematria of the first and last verse in the Bible, the equal 1188. And that was yesterday on the mind calendar. Okay. Yeah, so I think yesterday being the first day of the first month is just a symbol that's connecting us to this year. Is this year where that divorce is complete? And I believe it is within the movement, within that present truth context. I know with Angela, she doesn't like the word exiled from the movement, from what, I mean, all I could do with that, Angela, that would be simpler is, uh, how about if I did this? Does that satisfy you putting quotation marks, a scare quotes around movement? Excel from um, maybe maybe the the majority of the movement that calls itself the present truth movement. I don't know. I yeah. I consider myself a Seventh Day Adventist. In I mean I don't have all the knowledge that you and mo many others have, but I crave that knowledge and I want to grow in accordance with that knowledge. I don't yeah. want to say okay. Now we have the sudden revelation from the papal source, uh, who I won't bother naming, but we all know who it is. And and unless we we're following that papal source, we're excluded. We're we're not we're we're we are the fanatics now because we're trying to follow what is the foundations of the of the whole Seventh Day Adventist end time Christian movement. This yeah. is really a cross for me to bear. You know, yeah. but I guess yeah. we're all called to bear it. If we want to continue, Jesus said, ye are my disciples indeed, if ye continue in my word. What, what, happen, what happens to a movement when it stops moving? 
It retrograde. It stagnates and retrogrades. It's a By physical that, law. It's a universal law. It's it not becomes a, a it becomes a church, don't it? Yeah, but I'm just saying if it it's who, not a movement. Who it, it, are the church, William? Who are the church? Those that do the will of my Father. We're the brethren of Jesus. How but, how much daily do we need to do His will? I mean, I'm coming up conflicts with everybody and everything because this is what I this is my stand. I'm sorry. I feel like Martin Luther. Here I stand. I can do no other. Do right. you think so, my flesh likes it? Do you think I don't want to have more friends and more people supporting me? Well, what would they be supporting? An yeah. illusion. Well, an they've got, an to, 18, they've got eight, to go on with God. I have to go on with God, no matter what. In 1863, they stopped being a movement and, and, and started being the church. Right. Yeah, and 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 so the church, the church never. Yeah, and and that's what we don't want. So. To be exiled from the movement, we weren't really exiled from the movement. I understand that. But the fact that we ha experienced this exile, it does, does lead to a deeper understanding of just as it did with them being, you know, basically persecuted and being chased to the United States. It led to Adventism, right? Having the United States be there, uh, allowed the Seventh-day Adventist Church movement, the Millerite movement, to exist. And so so we know that. So we know that if, if you stop moving, by definition, you're not a movement. And so we want to continue to grow and learn in understanding, right? So so when you talk about the movement, we're just talking about this movement, but obviously the majority of the movement isn't even a movement anymore, right? It's It's rejecting God's leading, um, in the past and, and wants to stultify. Mm. Anyway, we need to close exactly. with Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. I pray for a blessing for each person. Help them in their day-to-day -day trials and walk with you. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. Help us to continue to grow and to learn in the school of Christ, that we can learn of his meekness and lowliness. We pray for one another. We pray for our friends, our family. I pray for Heidi, for her birthday, that it can be a blessing um, and that you can speak to her and comfort her. And uh, thank you for all the things you do in our, our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.